Hi everyone. So this is a first of the virtual openings that um, I have thought of with a number of friends and collectors. The reason why I decided to do it was because I was supposed to have a show that was slotted for mid-July and because of everything that is going on it had to be postponed and not quite clear when it would be postponed till so um, I've been working on a number of really amazing large pieces and I was saddened that nobody would really get to see them in real life and an idea came to a friend and collector of mine, Debbie, who's in Idaho, and um, she said, well, why don't you show us what you've been working on virtually? So this is what we're doing today, and this is the first Facebook Live attempt. We had a private preview of this on Thursday, and there were tons of amazing questions that came through, so I'd love for today to be as interactive as possible. Um, so please feel free to pose any questions at any time. All the paintings here, there are over 20 different pieces hanging, have little red dots on them. And in gallery terms, that typically means that they're sold, but for our intents and purposes, fear not, um, they have little numbers on them. So each painting has a number, and I'm gonna tell you what the number is, um, or we'll try to zoom into it. And if you have questions about that particular painting, just um, tell us the number. I can't see you, but I have my lovely husband here who is helping out and an amazing friend and collector, Belina, who will flag me down um, if there are any questions that are coming up. Um, so this is gonna go in terms of, it's gonna be set up sort of like a museum or gallery tour. I hope that you ha will have a nice relaxing hour ahead of you. So get a little glass of champagne if you're having brunch or just try to relax into it and enjoy yourself and hopefully you'll be able to dissolve into art and feel a little bit more relaxed, be able to breathe out and truly set yourself up for a nice weekend. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I'm gonna start with number one. But before I do, I wanted to <clears throat> I wanted to show you how I start. So we um, travel a lot as a family, and I really believe in spending some time in a place and really dissolving into it. So everywhere I travel, I create these watercolors that are done in plein air. So these are going to be the first two paintings that we'll look at, the Venice piece and the piece of the Japanese arch next to it. Um, so this Venice watercolor done in plein air in Venice was created when I was on a break with my family. We were actually in Venice twice um, this past year in the summer and also um, right before COVID started. <clears throat> and I kind of plopped myself onto a little stoop where the gondolier had his uh, gondola set up and he was very pissed off with me because I was taking up his space and of course my kids had to make themselves comfortable too and paint for a little bit um, and they were excited for about 20 minutes and then they were done but it was very thrilling nonetheless um, and then I was there for another hour, hour and a half um, sketching so until he was completely um, angry that things weren't happening for him and I had to leave. Um, and then that watercolor had shifted into this painting. And we can look at it a little this will probably show it a little better. So you'll see that the colors in the painting are different than the watercolor. Even though I know what colors I have been using for the watercolor, I sometimes shift them depending on my mood or they're just a lot more vibrant because 
what I use is a mixture of oil paints, Holbein oil paints, which is a really amazing Japanese brand, pretty expensive, very pigmented, and wax. And that's what really gets me this texture. So, um, and I, as weird as it might sound, I use very, very few colors. So even though this piece looks quite vibrant, there are only a green, a blue, a yellow in it, and just a touch of red for, um, for certain accents and browns. And I love using opposite colors because then I can get some really deep browns with some really nice variations happening. So this piece has three or four different layers on it. And it was slotted to go into the exhibit in July, which would focus on water. And what I especially love doing is doing all of these layers in subsequent layers. Some of them are transparent layers so that you can really see the melting of the water. And what I particularly like about painting Venetian landscapes is that when I'm in Venice, and I've been to Venice probably four or five different times, you can really feel the buildings merging in with the water, reflecting in the water, the trees are swaying and they seem to be dissolving into the buildings and the sky, it's, it's just all part of this one amazing medley of layers and history and peeling paint and that technique is amazing um, to really express that peeling paint. Um, so this is painting number one in case anyone has any questions, and it measures 30 by 40. I kind of have three favorite sizes that I've been working in. Um, this is 30 by 40, um, then there's 36 by 48, and then you'll see some really large ones that were slotted for that same exhibit that are 40 by 60. And then a little later today, we're actually gonna do a demo of some very exciting things that I'm finishing up and another huge piece with the addition of gold leaf, which looks really, really magical, and some melting drips. Um, so this piece number two is of a Japanese arch into the woods, and I love these entrances that kind of take you into a mysterious place and you feel like you're entering into an unknown territory and you don't quite know what awaits you and there's all kinds of exciting things that are just around the bend and this was done in the winter time and believe it or not it has just three colors so there's purple and yellow which are opposites and because they're opposites when i mix them together i can get some really nice deep browns and also there is a touch of green because even though it was a winter day, it was so full of warmth and sunshine that everything just sort of looked <clears throat> like it was glowing. So I love that about this piece. This one has been probably commented on the most. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that it looks like Monet's Giverny Garden um, with water lilies and the hanging bridges. But this is actually done in Boston. And the, we have this really short, probably two, three week period of time when sakuras, um, cherry blossoms are coming out. And it is just absolutely magical to be witnessing that. And I try to get out every single year and do a number of watercolor sketches so that I could catch that glimpse of the, of the season. And here as well, there are just a few colors, pinks juxtaposed with greens because they are opposites and I can create all kinds of different textures for those as well as, um, so greens, pinks, and a little bit of blue um, is pretty much all there is to it. Maybe there's a touch of yellow in there somewhere. Um, any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Doing okay? All right. 
Excellent. Um, now, number four is a piece that I absolutely love and I actually used it as the cover for my book, which is called Searching for a Place to Call Home. And it's a book where I compile a lot of my musings about the correlations between painting practice and what happens in real life. Because a lot of times what I'm struggling with in terms of figuring things out in a painting is actually a reflection or a mirror of what I'm struggling with in real life. So for instance, if I get stuck on a certain area or if I'm stressing out that the perspective is not quite perfect, that really is a mirror of what I am going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And the painting practice, when I come out of it, is um, always has this aha moment at the end where I think of, oh, well, something could be done differently, you know, for this situation or that situation. And this started happening to me um, just before we progress too much. When I got back into painting, I went to, um, so I'll give you kind of a little bit of my overall story um, and how my painting practice has evolved um, or how I got back into it. Um, I went to, um, I went to Cornell University um, and got a bachelor's in painting. And then um, kind of freaking out about the stigma of a starving artist, I tried a bunch of different things and went into the gallery world thinking that it would be really, really close to who I was as a painter. And I managed a national art gallery chain for seven and a half years, traveled all over the world, for different art fairs and biennales and met all kinds of fascinating clients um, like Kanye West and lots of Hollywood actors. But it would, had really had nothing to do um, with me being an artist. And when I was pregnant with my second child, I was getting so overwhelmed and so I was so full of panic that I knew that something in my life was missing. And that's when I started to very slowly get back into my painting practice and eventually quit my gallery position and decided to become a full-time professional artist once again with some classes spruced in between because I thought that I didn't see really great art education out there for kids and I was really looking for something for my kids so I started teaching classes where there was a mix of soul and love that I have for the painting practice but also art history and exploration of different materials and I just love watching kids and adults really get into the practice of painting, of experimenting, that's what this is really about. Um, so the book, coming back to this painting and the book, um, is half of those musings between art um, and what it does for our psyche, and half of kind of a semi-biographical journey um, of an immigrant, because I'm an immigrant from the former Soviet Union, and I came over when I was 13, um, and it's about this journey of a young woman who is trying to find a place to call home. And she travels all over the world, different European countries, Australia, she goes back to Russia to really try and find that place where she could feel like herself to realize, and I'm kind of giving away the ending here, but I hope you'll enjoy it anyways. Um, only to realize that it's her painting practice that is actually her true home. And no matter how small or how large that space is, it's really about the process of dissolving into the practice that feels like home. Um, so that was done, because um, that was one of the questions um, that I got on Thursday during the private preview. This was done in the French countryside and what I love is that they're all of these little homes that are kind of spruced throughout. And this was a rare occasion for us. We um, rented for the very first and probably last time in our lives, um, an actual castle in um, the Dordogne Valley, which was just absolutely beautiful. It had an Olympian sized pool and it was overlooking 
this vista, and there was another castle kind of up top on that um, hillside, and it was just so calming and so, it, it just brought me so much joy that um, we have this piece hanging in our kitchen. Um, and every time I look at it with my morning coffee or making snacks for kids, I feel very joyful and very calm and very serene. And that's what a lot of collectors who have pieces of mine in their homes say about the works and what they do to them. So I'm happy that that feeling translates. Um, I did think for a second there that I would be an excellent stay-at-home mom. Um, when my second child was born and I left the gallery, but I only lasted for about six months. Um, and I had so many ideas circling in my head that um, it just felt like I needed to do something. Um, and I know that a lot of us can really right now because we're all stay-at-home moms these days and it's tough. And I urge everybody to try and find that something that makes them um, truly unique and makes them get away from it all to recharge and regroup and prioritize things. I think it's especially important right now with all of the different new responsibilities we have taken on. But moving on, because I don't wanna keep you for too long. So this was number four. We're gonna move on to number five, which is right there. And this is a piece um, that was created in Israel, in Jaffa. We go to Israel every couple of years and I absolutely love Israel because to me it is such an incredible medley of cultures and you feel like you're really visiting the whole world when you're there. And um, there are a couple of really funny stories that happened to us, um, just to give you a perspective into what Israel means to me and to my family. Um, I think in that, during that particular trip, um, trip we um, came over during the Easter season, and it was one of those Easter's and Passover when all of the different Christian sects had Easter on the same exact day. Um, so on Friday, before Easter, there's this big procession that takes place in Jerusalem where everybody visits all the different sites that Jesus um, has visited on his journey. And because all of them were celebrating at the same time, there were literally hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there that were all walking in a certain direction to get to those sites. And then halfway through, their leader, who was taking them through decided that they were going the wrong way and it was just absolute insanity because everybody started trying to change directions and the only way for us to escape was to climb up to the roof of the Austrian embassy where we could actually enjoy ourselves um, so that kind of gives you a perspective on how crazy things are um, and then another thing that was fascinating and I think that somewhat relates to this piece and what I was thinking of is that during my middle child's first trip to Israel, he became obsessed with the sounds that are coming out of mosques. So he would make us sit in front of a mosque for hours at a time, just so we could wait for the next call to prayer. And he could listen to, um, to the songs that they were singing. Um, so that was really funny. But this is Jaffa, which is an old area of Tel Aviv. And I love the fact that there's a clock there because it's kind of a worn out clock that shows you layers of history and layers of cultures that are, that are there. And this is also just a few colors. So, and you can actually see that it's purple, yellow, and just a touch of green. And what's fascinating is that this piece and that piece in Austria were done at about the same time with pretty much the same colors, just inverted. Um, this is a little Alpine village called Zalbach in Austria, and it was absolutely freezing painting um, a watercolor when I was there. Um, and what drew me to it, I think, for the most part, that part of Austria has these really 
incredible steeples that kind of look like onion domes. Um, and it's probably the nostalgia in me that keeps wanting um, to relate to my Russian upbringing and the onion domes, but it also, it's also contrasted with this very austere German Austrian look. And then of course there's the backdrop of the Alps and this incredible winter softness, which, which I really, really love um, about this piece. And this is number five. So this was number six, I think I jumped. This is number seven, and this is another cherry blossom tree in Boston. And if, any, if there are any questions, guys, let me know, because I'm happy to stop at any point um, and answer those. Um, and for the longest time, you know, ever since college, I have been a huge fan of the myth of Daphne. And Daphne is a Greek semi-goddess that um, turns into a tree to escape the world. And that myth has always just been very close to my heart. So I keep coming back to the figure in the trees or to just painting the trees. And this is one of those pieces that has to do with rebirth and, um, and the medley of colors and the expressiveness um, of branches coming down. This was done in Greece and it's olive groves in Greece, also a very limited palette. And people have been saying that it reminds them of some Van Gogh pieces. This is number eight. Um, and what I love doing with the process that I'm using, and you can probably, I'll talk a little bit more about this for this one, but what I do every half hour as I paint, and usually each painting takes four, five, depending on size, seven sessions to complete. But every half hour, I flip the piece on its side so that I'm not stuck on certain imagery, especially when I work from photos, because it's really tough to not get stuck in certain details. Um, and when you flip things sideways, you then start paying attention to formal elements like lines and colors and shapes. Um, and the very last layer, which is the most rewarding, is when I take a heating lamp, and I'll show you that a little later today, and I start melting certain sections. Um, and for those drips, what's really fascinating to me is that I can't quite predict where they're going to go as much as I try to control it. Um, so there are some mishaps along the way but I strongly believe that there's no such thing as mistakes in art. It's just a matter of what you're gonna turn it into. So some of those drips I leave as they are, and some of them I cover over on the next, um, in the next session. But you can see how I wanted the mountains to really go up into the sky. So that was then upside down, or the mountains coming down into the groves and that feeling of grass moving that feeling of um, kind of a mountainside and the fields moving. Um, so there are all of these different textures and that feeling of really being there, listening to the sounds of birds chirping, of do dogs barking, of the wind swishing through that I'm trying to capture. Um, and of that kind of overall serenity of being there and dissolving into the landscape. Let me know if there are questions, um, if I need to stop at any point. Um, number nine, on Thursday, um, this piece had a ton of questions, so I'm gonna try to go through some of those. So this was done, that was one of the questions from Michael, um, on an unstretched canvas. And the reason why I do that is because it's so it would, be, would have been so large and heavy if I were to put it on an easel that it would just be impossible to work on. So I buy unstretched canvas and I have these panels that you'll get to see a little later. And I also am able to twist things on those panels. And I work on this piece. This took uh, about seven weeks to complete because there, it took a couple sections, um, sessions just to get the composition down. And it measures 40 by 60. I don't know if you can really see that. Um, 
and then a couple of um, sessions to get the palette down and the colors that I really wanted to be there. Um, and then some new things that I started doing this year and I was super excited to show for this exhibit is I started adding sections of gold leaf to really show um, that light shimmering. This was done in Falmouth on Cape Cod. Um, friends of ours um, showed us um, this amazing marsh field which was really, really nice. Um, so there's some gold leaf throughout. Some of it is covered um, and some of it is left to be seen and it changes throughout the day. And then, then there are these really amazing sections of paper elements that are added in and then painted over. And I have two versions of this piece um, that I was working on simultaneously. There is this large version that's 40 by 60 and there is a smaller 18 by 24 inch version that um, that was a commission going to Pennsylvania to um, Philadelphia area um, so super super psyched that at some point this piece um, and the reflections were very important to me too is going to be stretched when the frame shops are open um, and um, and people would actually be able to see it in an actual live exhibit. Um, I'm gonna move on because I want you to look at a little bit of the process as well. Um, this is number 10. And what is most fascinating about this piece is the conversation of textures. So one artist that I absolutely love is Gerhard Richter and what got me into textures were some of his textures. And you can really see the influence in the water here um, with all of these different layers that are kind of smooth and scratched out that are juxtaposed with those jagged, almost Van Gogh-like trees that are swaying in the wind right before a storm. Then, contrasted with the very, very dramatic clouds um, that are up above. Um, so it's really about this conversation between textures and very little, very little color. Um, and then this piece I brought specifically because I knew that uh, it, was, it was Polina's favorite and she's here today. Um, so this is 30 by 40 and it has a gold frame on it. Um, because what drew me to this piece in particular was um, this visitor that I kept getting in my studio. And it was a hawk that would come and just sit on a tree right in front of our, my window, almost asking me to sketch. Of course, the bird probably had no idea that I was sketching it at the time. Uh, but it was winter and there were practically no leaves, just tiny sections of those, um, that red tree that still had the berries on it. And it was um, sunset time. So it was that contrast of blue and orange. It's really just blue and orange in this piece. And because they're opposites, they gave me these really nuanced browns that I love with some touches of red. Um, so really about that warmth of winter sun against the bright blue skies. That's what, um, that's what this piece is about. And before we go into the studio, this is a stretched, um, this is what it looks like when it's stretched, a 40 by 60 piece that was done in Miami. Uh, the sketch for it was done in Miami and it was really tough to do because it was a uh, very short vacation with three kids and they were running around and going crazy but my lovely husband understood that I could that I really needed to be there and complete that sketch because otherwise the vacation would not end up well for uh, for anyone involved so he let me sketch and it was absolutely lovely and I love the big skies that you get over uh, water in Miami. And it was, it took me the longest time to really figure out the shimmer, um, that really slight shimmer. And I wanted kind of a baby sailboat in there to show through.
All right, so we are gonna step into the studio and so that I could show you the actual process. I'm gonna go through some of the last things that I have just been recently working on. This piece is shipping to um, Debbie in Idaho and this is a view um, out of her backyard which I'm very, very jealous of. We might have to come visit her this summer. Um, and this is the smaller version of the Falmouth Cape Cod Marshes piece that was out in the vestibule. And then this um, next really large piece was another influence by Monet. A lot of people ask me, and that was one of the questions um, from Jennifer on Thursday when I had the private preview, what would I call the style that I'm working in? And a lot of people have called it impressionist, uh, but it's a little more than that because there's also um, a lot of very expressive lines. I work primarily with palette knives, almost exclusively with palette knives, and there are days when I come in and I'm just super pissed off at the world and I could just slash the canvas with my palette knife and that makes me happy. And then there are other days when I would come in and I would pacify the piece a little bit. So it's really between impressionism and expressionism. And a few years back, I was talking to another friend of mine who is in the art world and she said, oh, your pieces are so whimsical. And I got very upset at first when she said that because I thought, well, they're not whimsical. They're very serious pieces to me. They're all of my emotions that are going into each painting. And then I thought about it and there is a lot of whimsy because what I'm showing is this kind of love for the world and um, the whimsy of being there and really enjoying um, whatever our world is able to offer us. And I think we need to do a lot more of that now when the pandemic is out there and um, and we need to be looking forward to things. So this piece, I'm actually, I um, don't know if you noticed, but I am also starting a fashion line and this is one of the first items in the fashion line, but um, a lot of them are gonna have the pattern that you see in this painting um, or the print. Um, so I'm super psyched to be working on that too. Um, and this is based on Monet's Water Lilies and it's done in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And you'll see that there is a bit of gold leaf here too, um, and chunks of paint that have not been mixed in. And I love how there's this transition from chunky areas to very smooth and soft areas. Um, that's what kind of really, really gets me going. And this is Rome, where I spent a semester and I lived right near this area, which is Campo di Fiori and absolutely loved it because it was just so lively and busy. Every time I was there during any time of the day, in the morning at six o'clock in the morning, there was a bakery on the corner and there are all of these smells oozing in from there. And then at two in the morning, people were still buying ice cream and having their cocktails and the scooters would be streaming through. Um, and you'll see here too, I love these sections where there is paper elements and then they transition into painting and then there's some gold leaf elements that are mixed in as well um, in certain sections um, so there's more paper over here transitioning into gold leaf and into paint and all of that just makes it so vibrant and so alive So without further ado, I'm going to start working on a painting that I am trying to finish right now. This kind of gives you an overview of the studio. This was a piece that um, was done in Yellowstone and we're hoping that we'll return to Yellowstone this summer um, to do some more sketches. And this was my very first piece from um, the Daphne series. Um, well, actually, there was another one before that um, when I was in college, but it was stolen. It was this huge piece, which was almost like a self-portrait, um, and 
it's not there anymore. But this was a second piece with some Jackson Pollock techniques mixed in and um, lots of splatter painting and a woman softly turning into a tree. Once again, sections that are blended in and reflecting in one another. And what I'm working on right now, uh, it's almost there, is um, this incredible park in Colorado. Um, I have no idea how to spell it. I think it's Uncompahgre National Park, but it has these, um, it's commissioned by um, Karen, um, who is from Colorado, and um, it has this intense medley of aspen trees, which are very close to birch trees, and as some of you know, I'm obsessed with those. Um, also the nostalgia in me, um, and um, just all kinds of different elements going on. Um, and I'm working from a photo. Um, one of the questions that I had on Thursday was um, how often I work from photos as opposed to working from the watercolors and plein air. And lately I've been using a lot more photos because I feel like all of these landscapes that I've been looking at, because I always have worked in landscapes, I've almost internalized and now there's so much more to say without necessarily a particular image that I'm looking at. It's more of an internal landscape that I'm painting every single time. So it really doesn't matter anymore whether I'm working from a photo or, um, or a watercolor. But I'm gonna take my sample jacket off before I get it dirty um, and get my apron on. You guys let me know if there were any questions while I was talking this whole time. Um, so I am using for this piece, believe it or not, just three colors. I have um, an orange, a yellow, and a blue, and some white. And there's my big jar of wax. Um, so that gets put in to whatever I'm mixing right away. Um, another question that I had on Thursday was, um, can this wax be made at home? Or have I ever made it at home? And the answer is yes. When I was in college, they taught us that if you take some terpenoid and you put beeswax into a little pot and you start mixing them together, that um, you will pretty much get the same wax medium. Um, but the fumes didn't feel like they were really incredibly healthy to consume. So I decided that I would just be buying these big jars instead. Um, and the technique that I'm using with the wax is um, partially an ancient technique that um, ancient Romans used and it's called encaustic, and they did take pigments, it didn't have to be oil pigments, but any sort of pigment, and if you mix it with wax and start painting with it, you get these really amazing textures that go from soft to hard, and you can truly experiment. But um, what I haven't seen done before, and I think that's my kind of personal um, accomplishment, um, so to speak, is the dripping effect um, and really twisting the painting and having the drips go in different directions. Um, so I wanted to work on, let's see, what did I notice the last time I was here? So as you see, there were some accidental drips here and I kind of want to work a little bit on those and blending those in. I'll leave some of them in there because I want that abstract element in it but I also want to um, show you what melting looks like. So there are a couple of trees in certain sections that I'm gonna show you how to melt and a couple of areas where I want to add a little bit of, um, a little bit more of the gold leaf. So let's see, where should we start? So I'm gonna start by doing just a little bit of gold leaf here. Um, 
and it's actual gold um, in small quantities and um, and that's what they use in all of the different churches I'm in love with some of the early Byzantine churches that you see in Ravenna in Italy um, and that I was had the pleasure of seeing in um, in Sicily last year so if I put down a little bit of truly any color leaving a section of gold leaf which is really nice and there's some gold leaf that I wanted to do from here so I'll do just a tiny bit and I have a perfect sized piece for that and some of these are going to be covered over some of them are gonna stay and it's it's pretty fragile um, so it will stay with the gold leaf on there and it kind of attached with oil paint um, but if I go over it slightly I can also blend in or take off certain sections And I kind of go with the flow if I mixed a certain color that I love because what's important um, ultimately when the painting is finished is when somebody is looking at it, a person's eyes are moving across the painting. And what they want, what their eyes are catching actually, are similar colors that they're seeing through throughout. Um, so what I want to be doing is having some of those similar colors dispersed in all of the different sections of my painting. Um, what's especially nice on these last layers, by the way, is going with a light color, almost translucently, over some dark areas. And because it's a translucent color, you can see all of the layers underneath and it really a lot of people believe that you need to use darks in order to make things come out but it's actually a lot of times the light colors that that bring everything into into a certain depth um, so now that i'm almost done with that particular color and see it gets really chunky um, and if i don't want it to be this pure orange if I just add a tiny bit of blue I still have orange but if I mix it in it's just a much deeper orange that I could use and because I'm blending certain colors that were in this piece um, in other areas so because there's a little bit of blue in this orange it works with all of the other uh, blues that are there a lot better almost kind of abstract sense what I'm essentially doing is ooh, see this is really really nice um, this size I also really love because another one of my loves is Mark Rothko 
and he was very particular about the sizes of paintings that he created because he believed that if a painting is a certain size and you stand at the right distance from it, usually it's about 18 inches, um, then you could truly, because it's almost the same size as you, you could literally enter into it and be one with it and really feel like you're dissolving into it. Um, so um, that's why I think I'm drawn to this particular size. So I'm gonna work a little bit on this tree and melting that and a little bit on this tree and melting that tree. Um, so I'm gonna mix my green. But because I want, so with melting, what's interesting is that different colors melt at different speeds. So for the sake of showing you what happens, I'm gonna use a darker color and see what I'm doing. I'm not just using blue and yellow to make my green. I added a little bit of my orange into it. So that makes it not only darker, but it makes it into a more interesting, deeper color. And then we'll just put it here. Where's my beauty lamp? Oh, stuck. And sort of wait and see what happens. Now, what's interesting with the melting is that I can't really predict what layers are going to melt in addition to the actual section that I'm melting. And there is an element of control, but there's also an element of surprise. And I love doing this in that very last layer because what that does is it breaks boundaries between reality and abstraction. It's almost like I am Gaudi and I was building all of these textures and castles made out of sand and then I'm sort of taking the time to to break them apart um, and some things are getting picked up some colors are getting picked up from other layers and I'm just sort of letting it flow and seeing where it's going to go Amazing, uh, one amazing question that I had on Thursday as well, because um, I had a lot of musicians um, visit during the private viewing, was what kind of music do I listen to while I paint? And it really depends on my mood of that day. When I was in high school, I was a huge heavy metal fan. Um, so I would put my favorite heavy metal music on. Let's see what happens here. And if I'm particularly angry, um, it makes me feel better. And then on another day, and I would just really start slashing the canvas with my palette knife. Um, and then on another, on another day, I would come and I would just calm it down and listen to some classical music or I love uh, to dance while I paint so I could put on some gypsy funk or zazz or other French singers um, a little bit of um, Spanish uh, mixes um, that are out there um, reggae um, is wonderful for some of those super super active days and that really helps me reach, oh, I got another layer from the other day catching and see how the colors are kind of mixing on their own. Um, so what happens when I dance or when I have a certain music on, it just lets me reach to that little inner child with me who is playing and dancing and exploring and just being really, really happy about the whole process. And that's what painting really is about for me is about um, bringing out joy and connecting to 
my inner core and who I really am um, and grounding and redefining priorities and that is super super important so you see this just gave me a beautiful beautiful section of its own that is just full of greens and blues and yellows and you'll see that it looks totally different um, with different light and different times of the day another question that was asked and that I loved was whether I feel sad when certain paintings sell and I no longer get to look at them and it is actually the absolute opposite for me I am so freaking excited when things travel out to certain homes and I get to visit them once in a while I still remember pieces that we had at our home when I was little that I grew up with and I think they're really kind of etched into my memory and every time just a few days ago I went to visit one of my pieces and every time I look at it I think of what that piece does for certain people what it does to kids who might be living in that house and how they're growing up with it and it just makes me so incredibly happy because these paintings are sort of like my kids who are now grown up and released into the world and they now have a life of their own and they sort of make families gather and talk and reflect back on their trips and their memories and their joyful moments and that's what it's really about um, so I wanted to let's see how are we doing on time a few more minutes um, I wanted to show you one little element of adding some paper in and I have some green tissue paper um, that I could add in and then go over my glue that I use is a book binding glue um, of professional quality that I really love. I think it might be easier to access it this way. partially the glue that puts this piece in and partially some of the paint that will go over it so what happens I see I'm getting more textures more of these really exquisite textures when I start putting more colors in and it almost feels like there was, there were these really big chunks of paint that were put in. Um, that is really cool. Um, another thing, another new element that I think I'm gonna start adding in, I'm starting on another um, little commission on Tuesday for um, a good friend, Alicia, in Wisconsin. Um, and she wanted a piece of the Great Lakes um, but another great idea that I had gotten is to perhaps put some words into paintings, almost like affirmations that um, people who would then own them would almost sense because I would put them before I start on anything and then they would be covered up by paint, but that energy, that kind of vibration of the piece would still be felt um when the piece is completed so i'm super excited to uh, think of something witty on tuesday when i start painting this new piece Let's see what happens so orange might take a little bit longer to melt i think it's starting and then of course it's going to go into completely different grooves because now I have these paper additions. Green is going to go into the orange. 
pick up some, that's nice, some blue along the way. Almost like a river flowing into different grooves. I think I answered most of my questions that I had during the private preview on Thursday, um, but I don't know if there were any more questions that came through today. I know everybody has things going on, so I don't want to keep you for too long, but um, I work on commissions of all sizes, as you can see, um, so if you have an image that you have always loved, um, a photo. Uh, we can look through a bunch of those and, um, and decide what works. And I would absolutely love to, um, to get some new canvases in and to, start, um, and to start working on some pieces. This one is almost done. I'm starting on one on Tuesday and um, super excited to be in the studio, especially now with um, homeschooling kids needing some breaks in between. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this hour. Were there any questions, guys? No, we're good? Okay, excellent. Um, I'm wishing you um, a great relaxing weekend if you're watching it over the weekend. Um, and please feel free to get in touch. My website where you can see all of the pieces that you've seen here and some more because some of them are in different areas installed are on my website, which is www.dianastellin.com. Um, the clothing line is on Instagram um, and its name is Gallerista. Um, so on Instagram, it's gallerista.co. Um, and I have a few Instagram accounts. One is that kind of encompasses everything, the different talks and podcasts that I've been doing, uh, teaching, art and the other is strictly art um, so um, that one is called landscapes.ds and my main account is just under my name which is diana underscore stellan um, but thank you for watching thanks for being here um, and feel free to get in touch <laughs>